Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2022 VECO lecture. Uh, my name is David Mutimer and I am the Associate Dean Faculty Affairs uh, in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies as well as a Professor of Politics and I'll be your host this afternoon. Before we get to the meat of today's um, lecture, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the lands on which this meeting is taking place. Uh, since the meeting is virtual and because we are not all gathered in the same space, York's land acknowledgement might not represent the territory on which you currently find yourself. I'd ask therefore that you take responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are now on and its current treaty holders. I am situated in the area known as Tocoronto, and so I gratefully acknowledge that I live on the same territory as York University. As a member of the York community, I recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tocoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation Inuit and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the dish with one spoon wampum, an agreement peaceably to share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you again for joining us at this year's VECO lecture hosted by the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Marcello Mosto, who will receive a full introduction a little later. His formal address will be followed by an opportunity for questions and discussion. So please don't be shy about entering your questions by clicking on the Q&A button below as we go. We look forward to the discussion that will follow Professor Musto's talk. Each year, the VECO lecture focuses on one of two themes, the lives and contributions of notable Italians and Italian Canadians, or the role of the university, especially philosophy and the social sciences. This year's lecture, entitled Vico and Marx, Comparing Two Interpretations of History, touches on both, since Giambattista Vico was both an historically important Italian philosopher and a social scientist. If you need any help during the event, uh, please use the Q&A button to send us a message, and one of our team members will be ready to help you. I'd now like to invite to our virtual stage uh, Ravi Da Costa, who is the Associate Dean Research and Graduate Studies at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, to say a few words. Ravi. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, everyone, to York University's 2022 Giambattista Vico Lecture in memory of Fred Zorzi. For many years, this lecture has given us an opportunity to celebrate the contributions of Italians and the Italian Canadian experience and to discuss a range of topics connected to the liberal arts. I'd like to just give you a little bit of background about the lecture. Uh, it first took shape over 20 years ago through the efforts and contributions of Senator Jerry Grafstein and, and Mr. Elvio Del Zotta. Uh, in the year 2000, Senator Grafstein donated two rare volumes of Jan Battista Vico's seminal work, The New Science, to York University. Vico was one of the uh, world's first social scientists, modern social scientists, and The New Science was originally published in Italy over 250 years ago. If we were meeting in person, as I hope we will be able to do for the next Vico lecture, uh, you would have a chance to view these old and very beautiful volumes since we normally have them on display at the event. The Vico lecture was endowed through generous donations from Elvio Del Zotto and several of his friends and business associates uh, in the Italian Canadian business community. Uh, the lecture was established as a tribute to Mr. Del Zotto's late law partner, Mr. Fred Zorsi. In recent years, the Vico lecture has focused on a number of notable uh, Canadians, Italian Canadians, who are contemporary examples of um, Italy's and Italians' contribution to our multicultural city, our, our country and our world. These have included uh, the late uh, Fiat Chrysler CEO, Sergio Mar um, Marchioni, um, the Toronto heart surgeon, RJ Cusimano, and Vaughan Mayor, Maurizio Bevilacqua. We've also heard intriguing talks on the university and the liberal arts from the former Dean of uh, Arts, George Fallis, as well as public intellectual uh, Michael Ignatieff. Uh, 
This year, for the first time, the lecture will shine some of the spotlight uh, directly on Jan Battista Vico himself. This year's uh, speaker, as um, David uh, mentioned, is Professor Marcello Musto, uh, one of our colleagues in uh, the sociology department and a prolific uh, leading scholar on Karl Marx. Today, Professor Musto will de deliver a talk comparing the two different interpretations of history offered to us by Vico and Marx. I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to Elvio Del Sotto, to Senator Jer Jerry Grafstone, and their friends and colleagues for making the VCO lecture a reality at York. Thanks again for joining us today. Pass it back to you, David. Thank you, Eddie DeCosta, for your welcome and for giving us some background on the origins of the VCO lecture. I would now like to invite our keynote speaker to the virtual stage, Professor Marcello Musto. Professor Musto is a professor of sociology at York University and is globally acknowledged as someone who has made a major contribution to the revival of Marx studies in recent years. His major writings comprise four single authored books, 11 edited volumes, and more than 40 journal articles and book chapters. Marcello's works have been translated worldwide into 25 languages. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Marcello to our virtual stage today to deliver the 2020 Vico lecture entitled Vico and Marx, comparing two interpretations of history. Professor Mosto. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Can you see me and hear me? I guess so. So thanks to all of you for this invitation, to the faculty, to Professor Ravi da Costa, for Professor Mutimer for the kind presentation, and most importantly to Mariana and Tom for their work to make this um, lecture happening. So today we are in times of crisis from many points of view. And um, usually when there are times of crisis, it's useful to return to classics. It's useful to return to giants of philosophical thought, political thought. Um, Despite the passage of time, these authors are useful for us and still essential to understand society. So I would like to read this quotation for uh, uh, Bernard de Chartres. We are like dwarf on the shoulder of giants so that we can see more than they and things at the greater distance, not by virtue of any sharpness of sight on our part, but because we are carried high and raised up their giant sides. I believe that Vico and Marx both belong to these categories of giants of um, philosophical thought, economical thought, political thought, sociological interpretation. And what I will try today will be a very short and superficial, particularly with regard to Marx, because Marx is a scholar that I've been uh, working on for many years. So I didn't want to say a lot about Marx and not saying enough about Vico. So I think that I will leave Marx for more for the discussion, but of course there will be many references to his work. And the main topic that I will touch today is the interpretation of history in these two authors. But before doing this, since Marx is a very well-known figure and Vico less, I would like to provide a short intellectual biography of Vico, who was uh, Joan Battista Vico. He was born in Naples, um, my city. So today I will also be able to speak in my um, English with a thick Italian uh, accent without feeling bad about this. Um, and uh, Vico spent many years, almost 10, almost a decade in Batolla. Batolla was a small place where he was a preceptor of uh, four children of a nobleman. He was there between 18 and 27. This period was very important for Vico to, um, make his conception, his ideas, develop them strongly. Um, by the way, speaking of biography, Vico also wrote a self-biography when he was asked by a scholar, when he was invited by a scholar in 1728 um, to write something about his life and the development of his ideas. Um, this scholar was collecting the biographical profiles of, let's say, the main um, Italian um, men of letters, leading Italian men of letters. Vico went to the University of Naples. He studied at the Faculty of Law. Um, the University of Naples was the second oldest university after Bologna, a very prestigious one. And uh, in uh, 1698, at the age of 30, Vico became uh, professor of eloquence at the University of Naples. 
Um, I'm now skipping something that I will touch uh, very soon, that is the making of this masterpiece, the making of the new science. It is a, a process that lasts for a, a very long time. Um, there are three drafts, there are three versions of the new science, 1725, 1730, 1744. And uh, I want to focus actually on the fact that Vico was a marginalized scholar, despite of this achievement, despite he was professor, etc. Um, Vico was living at the time, um, not only France, but also, you know, the echo of uh, the Cartesian philosophy, the philosophy of René Descartes was very strong everywhere and also an important uh, philosophical center like the city of Naples. So there was hostility against anyone who would question everything that was not based on metaphysics. This is important for us to understand the context of Vico. So Vico was born just after these new times inaugurated by Descartes, right? After the cogito ergo sum. And um, I would like to say that, um, you know, um, we don't have time to enter in um, Descartes um, uh, philosophy, but um, we need to say, I must say that he won't, without creating, let's say a new word like uh, Comte did for sociology, he had this idea of uh, mathesis universalis, so a sort of universal mathematic who would be the new form of knowledge. And this is important for us. It's important to understand what happened after the discourses of methods of uh, Descartes, because there is a very strong hegemony of this rationalistic model, um, also thanks to scientific revolutions of lower Europe, of course. So Vico was an admirer of many aspects of the philosophy of Descartes. Uh, we can say a little bit like Marx was for Hegel, um, but for Vico, the Cartesian rationality was only the starting point because he wanted to present an entirely original reflection. And I think he did. Uh, Rereading Vico a little bit in this week was um, interesting for me. I think we can question whether or not Vico was able to achieve this or that, but we cannot question the originality of his, uh, of his path, of his, uh, of his idea. So, there is a deductive method, right? And this deductive method for Vico is putting uh, human knowledge outside of life. Like, you know, um, mathematic beliefs, this mathesis um, uh, universalis, um, to have the capability of assuming the objectivity of knowledge, right? Every time that there is this idea of the objectivity of knowledge, that, that there is something that is able to explain alone everything. We should be a little bit skeptical about this. And as you will see later, I will also criticize the conception of Marxist science, scientific socialism from this point of view. I will do it if I have time, otherwise during the discussion. So Vico is trying to take a step forward uh, from Descartes and is trying to put the I let's say grafting into the high, the historical memory and the consciousness of the facere, the consciousness of the making, which means knowing one own species through historical memory. I'm just putting concepts here. I will of course develop this later. I would like to read a wonderful quotation about Vico, of one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, the German hermeneutics, um, Gadamer. Gadamer wrote, in his polemic with modern science, Vico does not question its advantages, but wants to highlight its limitation. So Vico is not against Descartes, but not fully supporting this idea of Descartes. So even in time of the new science and mathematic method, one cannot do without the wisdom of ancients, their ideal of prudentia and eloquentia. So Vico is a humanist in high sense, and Vico is defending the legitimacy of humanistic knowledge against this excluding hegemonic model of Cartesianism. Um, uh, what is the reception of Vico? Uh, I would like to discuss a little bit. I've also prepared some uh, few slides. Um, so I believe that, um, and I'm opening this now. Um, we can say that um, in uh, 
the 18th century, there is a, um, Vico's work generated a lively discussion, not only in Italy, there are extensive debates in Italy, slowly, of course, but also in, in France, in Germany, as you will see later, the La Scienza Nuova, the new science, Vico's masterpiece was translated in the first languages like French, German, after a century um, uh, since Vico wrote it. Um, I will go to this point uh, very quickly. In the 19th century, there is a return to Vico in Germany with the, you know, the importance of historicism, the historicismus, this uh, school of thought. And what are the main topics of interest for Vico? The link between philosophy and philology, um, the reunification of increasingly fragmented fields within the humanities. So this things are useful for Vico to enter to his discourse, his writing in several European countries. And then also slowly later in the 20th century, particularly thanks to Isaiah Berlin, the influence of Vico in the Anglo-Saxon world. Berlin was particularly important because he moved the attention of the educated public from Vico's metahistorical musing to his methodological originality, which is something I would like to discuss later when we talk about, um, when I will speak about the, the, the most important topic of today, that is the concept of history. And in fact, with philology and philosophy, with the unification of humanities, there is also the concept of history, of course, as one of the main topics of the reception of Vico. So we can say that Vico widened the intellectual horizon of the 18th century scholarship by proposing a different way of understanding history. And from this point of view, his attempt is um, passionate and still speaks to us today. Vico was appreciated primarily as a philosopher of history, right, in the uh, 20th and 19th century. And I would like to read another wonderful quotation about Vico's contribution. This one is about from Horkheimer, the main interpreter of the Frankfurt School. Horkheimer defined Vico in an essay written in 1930, the beginning of the bourgeois philosophy of history, Vico as the first real philosopher of history of the modern era. Wonderful definition, like flattering definition. A few years later, he clarified this definition and Horkheimer said, the focus of Vico on human action as a precondition for understanding of history is exceptional, is wonderful. Very interesting for us, the fact that Vico was able to give significance to myth and religion because French enlightenment had left myth and religion, they dismissed myth and religion as something like, you know, a priestly fraud, tricks of religion, etc. Also a, a Marxist interpretation could go in that way. I believe not Marx himself, but it is uh, um, relevant for us to understand the significance of the interpretation of these aspects, myth, religion, etc. And also, of course, always in relation to history, the fact that Vico is useful to avoid this unilinear interpretation of history, this philosophy of history. So many Marxists noted, Lafargue, Lukács, I will return to this later, that Vico was an important forerunner of Marxism. There is this idea in Marxist tradition. I am strongly in disagreement with this, and I will try to explain later why. And also in Soviet Union, Vico was a peripheral thinker there, but was praised for his uh, historicistic approach. So um, I'm talking about the reception of Vico and I must go to the second point. Now, I want to say that in the second part of the 20th century, there is a, an increasing uh, suspicion by historians, you know, because historians had these aversions to generalizations, this aversion to ideas that there are historical courses and recourses. So Vico is put a little bit in a corner from this point of view, but is gaining a new audience, the audience of modern storytelling methods. And Vico has been excellent, perhaps the father of uh, all these things. So now it's time for me to share um, my um, desktop and uh, you can see this, which is the reception of the new science, the dissemination actually of the new science. I've been talking about the reception now. The new science has been published in 16 languages. You can see 
German and French translation a century after the Italian version. And then it took a while for Vico to be translated in Spanish, in English, and in many other um, languages. In the past years, you can see in the last uh, two, three decades, there are also new translation, also an important and um, you know, big um, possible audiences for the future, like you know, Portuguese in Brazil, 1991, Turkish in 2007. Since this is a comparison between Marx and Vigo, I also want to say something about Karl Marx. And um, you can see that uh, Das Kapital was translated in more than 70 languages, of course, not like the Communist Manifesto, but one of the most translated books ever. And these are just translations in full of the three volumes of Capital. Actually, you know, this information is not uh, very well known. I'm a sort of, you know, historian of uh, political thought. And uh, this is one of the things intellectual history that I like to do more. And thanks to um, my colleagues, uh, Baba Kamini, who is working on this um, book of, um, it's time a little bit for self-promotion now, that is called the um, Global History of Capital. We tracked uh, Baba Kamini and I, um, the 70 languages in which Capital has been translated and we are publishing a 1000 pages volume that will tell us the history of Capital. So I will now interrupt this um, and I want to do some PowerPoint. And um, now I can tell you who is Vico today, at least my opinion. So Vico is for educated readers, um, I would say an illustrious stranger, right? You know, somebody generally associated with uh, this idea of uh, ebbs and flows of history, this notion of course and recourses, we might have heard something about this. And even for academics, Vico is considered an obscure author or a difficult author to read, a convoluted author to read. Um, I will tell you later that um, Biko never said historical courses, every courses. He never used the expression uh, for which he is usually uh, remembered. Like Marx, you know, he just wrote five times dictatorship of the proletariat, or Marx never said historical materialism, he said the materialistic conception of history. Um, I will also try to um, point out some. Um, uh, scholars were responsible for these things. So there is an analogy of all these authors um, that are sometimes associated with uh, some things that they never wrote. But I want to tell you that reading Vico is very difficult for an Italian like me, for a Neapolitan like me, because of these writings of um, Italian from the 18th century, very redundant in the narration. Vico is a philosopher who writes like a poet. And um, there is a poetic style. And also because his books are full of Neapolitans. So there are also um, um, words that goes in that direction, which is a good thing because it's another novelty of the scienza nuova, of the new science. So this idea of not using the language of the scholars of the academia, but opening also with writing with a, a different language. And actually, and now it's time to introduce Karl Marx, um, the Moore, as uh, the author of the Communist Manifesto was called, when for the first time he um, mentioned Vico, as I will show you soon, he did it to his comrade Ferdinand Lassalle, he said, you will scarcely be able to work your way through the original, as it is not only written in Italian, but in a very peculiar Neapolitan uh, uh, language. I recommend the French translation, um, uh, la, la, la Science Nouvelle. So um, there is this uh, um, additional difficulties with, with Bico. Time is running very fast, I must go. But if there are students there who are asking, how to write a masterpiece, how to make a masterpiece. Well, you know, they should know that this takes a lot of work. In the case of Karl Marx, it took 14 years of preparation from the manuscript of 1843 to the Grundrisse that started in 1857 with the beginning of the economic crisis. Uh, the Grundrisse is the first draft of capital just to start. And then the, it took 
10 more years for, uh, to Marx from 87 to 67, 67 is the year of publication of Capital Volume 1, with many preparatory uh, drafts, including the theory of surplus values, to publish Volume 1. As you know, Volume 2 and Volume 3 were published by Engels after Marx died, and Marx was actually not even able to finish the revision of Volume 1. He wanted to change it. I wanted to say so many things about this, I have no time. But I want to talk about the making of the new science. And um, the new science, like, like Capital, is a work in progress. There were many different drafts and uh, is not finished, like volume two and three of Capital. And as such, this work should be read with presence of thesis that are not always going in the same direction and position they may, may appear unsatisfactory. The same with Marx, with volume two, with volume three. So I told you that Dico published La Scienza Nuova, The New Science in 1725, 1730, 1744. And this strata of work, if we want to borrow this um, metaphor from geologists, it is actually not sufficient to describe the difficulties of the writing of the Scienza Nuova because there are many sketches, many drafts that remain at the manuscript stage. So something very fascinated when you are a reader of these giants, of these authors, and I invite students, also you know, um, people who are in an advanced stage of life to read and reread the classics. And one exciting thing is when you read you know, um, the correspondence that these giants had, you know, the letters, the intellectual biography, and there is always the question of the order of your book the architectural structure of your book. And I want to read a wonderful letter that Marx wrote to Engels, not the entire letter, just a paragraph, that speaks for Vico, for Marx, and for many others. I cannot bring myself to send anything off until I have the whole thing in front of me. Whatever shortcomings they may have, the advantage of my writings is that they are an artistic whole. And this can only be achieved through my practice of never having things printed until I have them in front of me in their entirety. These things drove Friedrich Engels crazy because Marx didn't want to publish volume one until everything else was completed. And also reminded um, to Marx, the protagonist of the beautiful novel of Honoré de Balzac, the unknown masterpiece, the painter who was never able to finish his work because of the search for perfection. Um, perfection is nice to um, look, trying to do it, but also a dangerous um, uh, friend. So in the case of Vico, this architectural structure was even more difficult because Vico had a rupture, Vico had a break, Vico had a problem with the book that he published in 1725 that actually can be considered a completely different work. And there is a new book that is writing in 1730, as he wrote in the autobiography. In the first Scienza Nuova, I was certainly in order, if not in matters, because I treat of the principles of ideas differently from the principles of languages that were by nature united. All this was amended in the second Scienza Nuova. So this is the reason why this is happening. But I also want to say to our students that the first Scienza Nuova, it took 25 years of reading from Vico autobiography, continuous and bitter meditation on this subject. Right? So it takes a lot of time. If you want to write a masterpiece, you must have a couple of good ideas, but also it takes a lot of work, a lot of determination. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this 1725 edition, there is the beauty of Vico, because there, is, there are the themes of languages, metaphor, law, rhetoric, so you can see these uh, topics uh, coming out. And uh, the importance that Vico assigned to the process of formation of language. I will return to this. I also want to say that nobody read this book that Marx and Vico, sometimes they were not even able to print these books. They don't even have the money to do it. 
and um, 1725, it just uh, printed thanks to a few uh, money that uh, Vico had and it was sent as a gift to some people. Like Marx with the uh, hair fog in 1860, he published the book in German, in London, and nobody read it. Sometimes we have this idea, Karl Marx. No, the real um, um, condition of these thinkers in their life was sometimes different. I want to go back to this question of the architecture of the book because in 1730 edition, we have a new book. We have the final architecture of the work in the division of the internal book. Vico said, I've reduced my work and I increase it and I make it into a perfect system. And there is a lot about poetry. There is a great importance dedicated to Homer. And the poets represent for Vico the sense of humankind while the philosopher represented the sense of intellect. Vico is talking about poetic wisdom. Vico invites the reader to reflect, to reflect from a different perspective on the concept of reason. So Vico is expanding the concept of reason, is using literature, is using the past, is using poetry in order to help us understand uh, our society. And then there is finally the version of uh, 1744, the final version that was published a few months after Vico died in July 1744. Vico had died in January. So Vico dedicated a good part of his life as a scholar to this work. I would say Marx dedicated, Marx dedicated the main part of his life to capital. And it is good to read the version of 1744, even though it is uh, um, a little bit more different, difficult, sorry. So a new science, why Vico called his work a new science? Because Vico um, was aware of what he was doing. Perhaps he was far from being modest. He said, one must, uh, he, he said about his new method, um, I have a new method, I discovered a new method for which one must count as if there were no books in the world. He's saying this is the first book that is talking about this. So it's aware, he is aware of the novelty of his work. And in this new science, he's presenting what is knowledge, a new definition of uh, knowledge. So Vico begins with the vulgar knowledge and not from the knowledge of the philosophers. Vico is talking about uh, um, people and oral traditions um, because he wants to use this um, poetical um, um, uh, sources. And we can say that there is a tragic tension in Vico between sensitivity and reason. So Vico wants to remain fruitful to the earth, wants to remain fruitful perhaps to this small streets full of people of Naples while he doesn't want to abandon reason. So he wants to have the voice of the people and the reason of the philosopher. That's why he's writing in vernacular instead of uh, Latin. And that's why when it comes about history, why a new science, the human word can only be recognized in history, he will have told us today. Vico argued that we can only know what we have done. That's the important principle of Vico. And therefore, we can understand the history that has been made by humans. I will return to this essential point uh, very soon in a sort of a conversation with Marx. Now I must go to the main topic of our discussion very quickly. Um, there is the conception of history. So what are the main goals of Vico? In the book four of the edition of 1730 that I already defined as a sort of, you know, must be considered definitive in terms of architecture of the book, Vico said that he aimed to indicate, quotation, the course that nations take with constant uniformity proceeding in all their many various and different customs. So Vico tries to reconstruct an ideal eternal history, quotation now, over which the histories of all nations run in time. I wish I had more time to discuss what Marx would have said about this. Um, but the objectives that Vico had, the main goals that Vico had, 
reconstruction of the laws of the historical development of nation, that is something that also Marx wanted to do, including at the end of his life, when he wanted to check his materialistic conception of history vis-a-vis -vis with the, the real history. Uh, and uh, this is why Marx practically died writing uh, some notebooks about the chronology of history, not only the main economical events, but also the political events, right? The eco uh, ideological events, not only of history, but also in the Middle East, for example, because Marx wanted to check his idea, his conception of history, and want to see once again what happened, like you know, going back to history and trying to see this uh, um, passing from uh, a mode of production to another without this rigid interpretation that Marx had in 1859 when he wrote the preface to the critique of political economy, this idea of stages of history, um, you know, ancient mode of society, Asiatic mode of production, feudalism, capitalism, and eventually socialism. We can discuss about this in the Q&A time. So main goals of Vico, the course of history and the succession of historical epochs, the reconstruction and the understanding of the past, of course, and then the special feature of Vico is the importance, as I said, that he gave to the origins of human history. So, Historical recourses, this idea of historical recourses, as I anticipated a few minutes ago, it caused wrong interpretation of Vico's idea. The most common interpretation of historical recourses is an idea that there is a sort of theory of recurrence of history, like a cycle, course and recourses. I remember the first time I heard about Vico, I thought that the idea of Vico is this cyclical conception of history. I also remember that the first time I heard about Marx, I thought that he was a, a Russian um, revolutionary. Um, this idea that Vico has a, a statisk immobility history, the conception of something that is not moving, that Vico denied uh, any authentic and meaningful movement to history. This is completely wrong. So, Actually, Vico does not describe a cyclical model of history. And this is an interpretation that uh, um, I believe the main responsibility is with, the, with Benedetto Croce, like many Marxists did the same for Marx. I have no time. Uh, but I want to read for you what is the, or perhaps we don't have time for this. I just want to go to an important point of uh, the historical recourse. That is the idea of providence. So um, it has been said that the new science can be seen as a rational civil theology of divine providence, starting to be a little bit complicated now. I'll try to clarify this. The importance of religion. Vico is a devout Catholic. The recourse is an extreme possibility. The recourse is the idea that society will go back from a certain point of view, and there is the barbarianism of the past that is returning in the modern era. And this is for Vico an extreme possibility, not a necessity, a possibility, and not something inescapable. And the possibility of return to barbarianism is an extreme remedy put in place by providence. That's why I said a rational civil theology of divine providence. When, in an age of crisis and decadence, there is no other way to ensure the continuation of the history of mankind. I apologize for the students. This is a, a little bit a higher level of complexity. But this lecture is just an invitation for you to read Vico and Marx, nothing else than this. So for Vico, providence, let's say religion, is elevated from an object of faith to a principle of rational explanation, the rise and development of historical humanity. For Vico, um, it is the architect of the world of nation. And this is for me also one of the two main problems between Marx and Vico and why we cannot see Vico as a precursor of uh, Marx, differently from many Marxist uh, interpretation. So I wanted to speak now for a few seconds about the historical events. These historical events, when we have an historical recourse, 
we cannot think that this is happening in the same form. Like we can say that this is happening, the return to barbarianism in the primitive force, but not in the primitive form. I'm trying to say that the restored institution can never be identical to the institution that they imitate. The recourse must not be conceived as a recurrence, the cyclical idea of history, but as an advancement that nevertheless is a return upon itself. So the return of a nation to its origins is for Vico a fatal illusion. Vico cannot be accused of this. And this reminds me of Karl Marx discussing with the Russian revolution that is at the end of his life about the idea of skipping capitalism and that um, a feudal social formation must not follow exactly the same stages of uh, um, the capitalist one. And also when capitalism is uh, um, um, taken in another country, like you know, Chernyshevsky, the Russian sociology, that's the example of New Zealand, it is not happening in the same form. And also Marx will say, Chernyshevsky will say in the same time that the capitalism that happened in uh, England is not going to take a century, it's going to take very uh, much less time because of course that mode of production was developed elsewhere. Now it is time for me, running as fast as I can, to tell you when Marx mentioned Vico. And uh, I want to say that uh, Marx was a book warming. That's why Marx was able to read Vico. Marx had left uh, beside his work, 200 notebooks of summaries of readings taken in eight languages from all disciplines of the world. And Marx gave a self-definition of himself. He said, I am a machine condemned to devour books and then throw them in a change form on the dungeon of history. This is the self-definition of Karl Marx. So Marx knew Vico, although he mentioned Vico uh, very rarely. I want to show you uh, once again with the, the PowerPoint, the quotations of um, uh, Vico that were made by uh, Marx. And uh, this is the first one it, uh, about Engels. It is not very important. I don't have the time to discuss this. This is the second one, it's a letter to uh, La Salle. La Salle is the leader of the social uh, democracy. He just published the book, System of Acquired Rights. Well, political leaders at the time were able not only to read, but also to write books differently from political leaders of our time. And Marx is interested in sharing Vico's ideas um, with La Salle. Marx praised Vico for being a pioneer in the fields of comparative philology. And moreover, Marx had an interest for the juridical dimension of Vico. For example, the original idea that the power of the pater familias was monarchic and despotic. But the most important quotation of Marx, of Vico made by Marx, is in a footnote of uh, Das Kapital. Um, in this uh, um, uh, chapter Machinery and Modern Industry, practically um, Marx said that um, since Marx is talking about um, <clears throat> the development of uh, um, a spinning machine, right? And um, John, um, I'm going to read it from here, Darwin had interest in the history of nature and Marx said, well, we should also have the same interest, if not more, in the history of productive organs of human beings. And thanks to Vico, here it is, human history differs from natural history in this because we have made the former, but not the latter. So Marx is coming back to this idea of Vico that we can uh, understand better what we have done. This is the idea of Vico. So Vico had the constructivist theory of knowledge Humans can only know what in some way they themselves make or construct. And Marx argued that uh, the concrete historical method is only materialistic and therefore the only science is in bold here in the quotation that I am uh, using for you. I have no time to, to discuss this uh, very much, unfortunately, but I must say that Marx perhaps misquoted and misinterpreted or mutilated a little bit interpret Vico. 
because Marx said, Vico says human history different from natural history. You can see the quotation is in front of you. And um, um, we have made the former, but not the latter. But actually Vico said that uh, the world of nature, not as Marx said, natural history. So Vico is contrasting the world of nature with the world of nation, with civil war. Uh, and most importantly, there is a very big problem here that is the religious approach of Vico. Marx is silent about this idea of Vico that God made nature and therefore only God can understand nature. We cannot, we made society, we can only understand society. So uh, Vico's view nature as God domain and humans cannot enter into that sphere. I will now take back the attention on me and I want to discuss in the final minutes that I have, the five minutes, David, right? I can see you, you're back. So the supposed connection and differences between Vico and Marx. Some scholars found similarities between Vico and Marx and the main topics could be, I had a long list, but I'm just mentioning too, the human beings make history and human agency is a crucial factor in the development of history. And the second point is that human history must be understood as a history of societies, not the individuals, not single human beings, but the society. This is a very strong connection. And that's why Lafargue, Labriola, Sorel, Sorel, Trotsky interpreted Vico as an autonomous conception of history was close to Marx's idea. Soviet Union, Vico as a, a sort of precursor of historical materialism. But I would rather speak of supposed connection and actually serious differences between Vico and Marx. Resemblances are not always real. So I believe that this footnote is not essential, but it's a sort of embellishment to the text of Marx. It's not that Marx owed a great intellectual debt to Vico. And there are crucial differences here too, I have a long list, I'm just mentioning two. The first one, let me say this in philosophical term, Marx is a monist. Vico was a dualist. This means that uh, Marx is an atheist, Vico is a Christian, as I told you. Nature and human beings themselves become at last a human creation and, and for Marx. And God is revealed as an outworm and outmodel ideological fiction. God is fiction. Nature can hardly have been created by God because God does not exist. Or rather, even better for Marx, he exists only as a human creation. So there is a big difference here. But the most important thing for me is the crucial distinction about the different conception of making history. So, when Vico is talking about making history, Marx is impressed about this idea of Vico that human beings make history, right? But the making to which Vico refers is not the material production of the Homo Faber, is not the practical, uh, is not the production, but is the practical creativity of communicating citizenship, citizens. So it's the poetry, is the meat, is literature, is the language. Vico and Marx meant very different things by making. Vico meant making in a communicative sense. For Marx, making on the contrary is the productive transformation. So the modification to which Marx refer is not Vico quotation, modification of our own human mind, but rather a modification of our social organization. The expert of Marx that are listening will remember surely the quotation from the German ideology, human beings between to distinguish, distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their mean of subsistence. And with that, of course, after this low morality religion ideologies. I have no time to talk about the conception of history of Marx, but I will take uh, one more minute to show you a possible encounter between Marx and uh, Vico. There is a return also to uh, the topic that I've chosen to start uh, the lecture, the need, the joy to read and reread the classics, right? And uh, there is a proof of that with Vico because even though everything 
he did was done with the gaze turned toward the past, Biko opened great horizon, big horizon to human sciences and inaugurated new itinerary for critical thinking. But the most wonderful things is that um, uh, associating Biko with Marx is that Biko was not a revolutionary like Marx, right? He was um, uh, um, a man of order, we, we will say, but he identified the civilizing process closely with humankind capacity for wisdom. For Vico, it is not possible to achieve wisdom without a deep practice of pietas. So in Vico, there is a strong sense of pity, empathy for the world of humans. And it is no accident that he decided to use the following words for the finale of his work. I'm gonna read this for you to sum up from all that we have set forth in this work. It is to be finally concluded that this science, the new science carries inseparably with its study of pity and that if one be not pious, he cannot really be wise. So students, people who are reading, listening, if you study, you do this not only for yourself, but you do it for the politics, you do it for the police, right? And you must do it in the sense at least of solidarity for those who are in trouble. From this point of view, we can say, bravo Vico, or bravo the old Neapolitan, as Karl Marx used to call him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Mosto, for a, a wonderful and, and thought-provoking talk. Um, I'm, I'm sure that members of the audience uh, are keen to ask some questions to find out a bit more of your thought and the ideas that you've, uh, you've presented here. Um, to that end, members of the audience, if you haven't done so already, please click on the Q&A button that you should find at the bottom of your screen and, and enter your questions and we'll try to answer as, as many as we can, uh, time permitting. Um, we have a few to, uh, to get us going, uh, Marcello, if, if that's okay. Um, we had discussed in advance my, my giving Marcello a, a couple of questions at a time. And of course, because this is an audience that's, uh, you know, at least in some sense academic, uh, very few of the questions are individual questions, they come in parts. So I've, I've gathered them into pairs that roughly go together, but uh, it'll give you some scope to, to uh, expand if you want. So um, first, a question that we received um, before your talk about the role of ideas in history, which perhaps touches on uh, some things that you said right towards the end, in fact, of your discussion. Um, what is the role of ideas in uh, these two thinkers? And then the, uh, the interesting question about how do you gain access then to the ideas of the majority who leave no trace of their thought? Um, and then a second question from one of the, the members of the audience today about uh, Vico's conception of the human. And in particular, I think about how he would understand uh, human equality. So something about ideas and something about, uh, about human equality. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so I will try to um, respond to this question of ideas by um, discussing one topic that I very much wanted to introduce during my presentation, but I couldn't because of time, the question of philology. So what is philology? Um, of course, what is philology for Biko? Of course, when we talk about ideas, um, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, in Vico, there is um, an extraordinary attention for uh, literature, for poems, for mythology. That is what actually the new science, a lot of the new science is about. Um, but Vico had a philological methodology. What does it mean? So philology for Vico includes the study of poets, historians, um, orators, grammarians, so there is a lot of ideas from the past, and as, as I try to say, that are um, uh, carried by, uh, by, by Vico. And uh, philology is actually, or what actually uh, Vico called the philological proof, confirm the, um, 
ideas of philosophy. So philology must confirm the general philosophical statement. So philology is going back into the ideas, going back into these documents of the past. And uh, actually, you know, if you wanna create an analogy with Marx, uh, an analogy that is of course also talking about ideas, Marxian synthesis of theory and praxis, right? And uh, might recall the uh, synthesis of Vico between philosophy and philology, theory, philosophy, praxis, uh, philology. Um, I will reject this um, uh, by reading uh, both of them uh, with, with attention, this deterministic ideas that, for example, sometimes we have about uh, Marx that the base of economy determines everything of the superstructure of the um, uh, theories, ideas, ideologies. But um, going back to the second point, because I, I know that I cannot take too much time for each of these questions, uh, but hopefully I will, you know, I'm available to discuss and to be in touch with um, some of the scholars interested in this, human equality. So I ended actually my um, uh, presentation with this and with the, the most um, uh, political, the most uh, political um, uh, statement of Vico, of the new science. Of course, there is a difference between, between the two because Marx is actually writing um, for class struggle while Vico is um, um, describing history and the presence of providence, right, as a, a sort of a, a salvation for, for human beings. So they cannot be compared from this point of view, but I try to, uh, you know, call the attention of the readers to um, the fact that Vico is not an isolated scholar and is, um, you know, interested in the sense, so I, we cannot call it human equality, but uh, pity, right, so this uh, empathy with the, with, uh, with the people. And I'll stop here because I want to leave enough time for other questions. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of questions on um, economics or political economy uh, that, that you might want to, to address. Uh, uh, someone's asked um, about whether it's a, an accurate comparison between the two to say that Marx is more focused on economics than, than Biko would be, and perhaps a little on, on what, uh, what Biko's thoughts on, on political economy were. And then more specific one around how Biko might have thought about what Marx will come to speak about in terms of colonialism and primitive accumulation. Do you have any views on the kind of basis of political economy in Biko's thought? Well, you know, the first, the, the last one is a, is a very difficult question and I try to avoid what author might say, you know, Marx is voting for this political party, what Biko would have said, et cetera. These are topics that um, Biko uh, could not uh, or did not develop. It's not the focus of his, of his work, you know, it, the, fo the focus of his work is going back to ancient Greek and Rome and trying to um, give us new sources through which we can have an understanding of history and the science of history. Uh, usually the scholars of Vico that I've read in the past week um, preparing this uh, lecture um, believe that uh, actually Vico touched more topics than, than Karl Marx because, you know, literature, mythology, religion, and actually Marx is uh, unfortunately still associated to um, political economy. So definitely Marx had more focus than Vico about political economy. But I also want to say that both Vico and Marx, for both Vico and Marx, humans enter into a relationship with nature through labor. So Vico is aware of this. Of course, there is always the problem that, you know, Vico view nature as a God domain and human cannot enter that sphere, but Vico is aware of that. Um, to make justice to Marx, I also would like to say, particularly the Marx that we read today after the new publication of his manuscript of his, uh, uh, you know, uncompleted draft or the notebooks of his research, that Marx touched many topics usually not associated with him. I don't know, gender equality, ecology, uh, 
you know, the scholarship of Marx in the last um, decades or more is uh, strongly oriented in that uh, in that direction, but also topics like, you know, uh, nationalism, migration, that are topics that are very important for our political agenda today. So I will say that um, um, Biko is aware of um, um, labor and political economy, of course, not like Marx, but also to make justice to Marx is not this author that is entirely focused in the conflict between capital and labor. And we can read Marx in a, in a very different way today. Thank you. Um, so we had a, a question while you were talking on um, the extent to which Biko and Marx share a deterministic view of history um, in the sense of the importance of chance events. And then just a moment or two ago, um, one of our colleagues has posted a, a question about um, the nature of progress in their views on history. And, uh, just to get to the question at the end of the comment, how does Biko's conception of history compare with Marx's given that he does not, sorry, that he does seem to have a different but real conception of historical progress in a way that uh, um, the other may not. So something on determinism and on progress in the two things can address those questions. Yeah, there are so many against me, David, right? And uh, so many yeah. questions, yeah. So, and growing every moment, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, I want to say that um, there is a, a sentence, a very famous sentence of Marx, um, the opening sentence of the 18th Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte. Marx said, human beings make history not as they please and under circumstances chosen by themselves, but under circumstances directly given and inherited from the past, right? This is something very well known about Marx. What is perhaps not known is that Marx devoted a significant portion of uh, the last years of his life to history. I try to mention this in, um, at the end of my talk. So Marx is returning to history in the 70s, from 77 in particular, after having conducted significant uh, uh, research on history at the time of the Grundrisse, you know, the famous forms which precede capitalist production, the part of the Grundrisse that was published by Eric Obstmann and became a very well-known text of Marx. So 20 years after Marx is reading once again history, it's not only European history, but actually there is a lot about you know, what we call today the global south. And not only India, you know, collected with, uh, with England, but uh, many other countries. When Marx is doing this, he is surely developing, as I anticipated uh, earlier, a non-deterministic view, a clear non-deterministic view, and also an opposition to this idea of historical progress. That is something that, as I mentioned with the quotation of Horkheimer, it is also um, um, useful uh, for Vico, because we said that this idea of Vico, this historical recourse that must not be read as a cyclical repetition of history was a good thing in order to avoid this idea of linear progress. But I must defend Marx as much as I can by negating this idea that Marx had this a conception of history, a theory of history that society is moving forward with stages, the five stages that I mentioned earlier. It is not like this. And when Marx is discussing in this very dramatic uh, um, question that he received at the end of his life, at the same time, an epistemological and a political question. I'm talking about the well-known letter received from the Russian revolutionary Vera Zasulich. And Vera Zasulich asked Marx, what do we have to do now that we have this obshina, the rural commune? Do we have to wait that capitalism is developing into Russia? Do we have to wait for 100 years? And then after that, we have to build a generation of revolutionary uh, proletarian workers from the factory, or we can turn the obshina into something socialist. So in this moment, many Marxists, the first Marxists, said that, of course, you know, capitalism should enter and should destroy all the um, previous forms of communal production, of a communal uh, sociability, I would say, to use a sociological concept. 
But actually, Marx was not of this idea. And Marx said that it was possible not only to start the revolution in another place of the world, and not only in the most developed capitalistic country like England or continent like Europe, if capitalism is already existing somewhere else, going back to what I said about Chernyshevsky, the example of New Zealand with England, that was very useful for Marx. But of course, these communal forms must be changed. They cannot be the communal forms of the past. So Marx is open to a conception of, of an idea of revolution that is not um, uh, predetermined, like revolution must happen where the productive forces are more developed. And Marx is clearly taking side of uh, activists, scholars, revolutionaries, who said that it is possible to skip one stage without thinking that the previous form of uh, you know, communal mode of production are the socialist forms of the future. Of course, Marx never had the idea that this of China will be what the socialist society will have because it is a place where there is no real collaboration between the different communities, where there is a, a strong uh, um, patriarchy within the family. So there is not emancipation, there are not, um, 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 there is uh, liberty, individual freedom is not developed as socialism should um, have. So I would say that uh, the historical progress in Marx is uh, challenged very seriously by this uh, um, revision that is making in the French edition of Capital very clearly. And then in these letters with the Russians um, uh, revolutionaries, when Marx is saying, I didn't want to write you know, the recipe of the cooking of the future. And I didn't write a theory of history that must place in the same form in the same countries all over the world. History is not like this. And um, this is a clear um, indication of his opposition to the idea of historical progress. This time I talk a little bit more about Marx than, than Vico, but you know, Vico was useful to break this idea because you know, thanks to Providence, we go back to some issues existing in the in the past. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. We have a couple of questions um, that are going to ask you to, to connect uh, Marx and Vico to some other significant thinkers. So one asking. Um, uh, for your thoughts on uh, Biko's in uh, sorry, influence on Herder or Hegel as mediators of his resemblance to Marx. And then a second that asks that if in your research on Biko or Marx, you found any references to Francis Bacon's work, Novum Organum, in particular um, ideas of Biko's new science as an addendum to Bacon's work. Well, these questions are very different, difficult for me to respond uh, for Vico because I'm not a scholar of Vico. So I don't know what Vico did with uh, Bacon, et cetera. And uh, for Marx, he was not a central uh, author. Um, the first question, I try to um, talk about the, the, the reception of Vico at the beginning of my, of my lecture. And there were some references of Vico made by, by Herder, Hegel, about you know, many other uh, um, giants of, of, of you know, philosophical thought, but not as significant as the sort of recognition that Vico is uh, you know, acquiring always in some small circles later in the 20th century. And I believe that this is very clear when we look at this chart that I presented with the translation of the new science. Because for one century, La Scienza Nuova has been read only by very few people who could read that kind of particular and difficult um, Italian. And then later, uh, this book entered France and Germany. I made connection with historicism, so definitely not the line of, uh, of Hegel. But, uh, uh, you know, it uh, circulated in Germany, and then it took one more century for this book to, to be read in, uh, you know, in, in English, in Spanish, and in some other minors, minors in terms of uh, number of millions of people who could potentially read, read Vico. 
So, you know, I made an example of um, Descartes and Vico and Hegel and Marx, like these two authors um, challenging the, uh, the, the, the mediators, challenging the, the, the main theorists of their era and their time. I would say that Marx was more successful than Vico, because even though Marx was not the head of the international proletarian party when he was alive, um, you know, he got a significant relevance after the Paris Commune in 1871 and as a leader of the political leader of the first international, Vico a little bit less. But I also mentioned the fact that the reception of Vico, um, not particularly in the schools of thought of, you know, post-Hegelianism, etc., was, uh, um, you know, still significant. And uh, it is a minor author today, like among the, the classics, but, um, you know, we are still talking about him in 2022, and that's a good thing. Thank you. Um, we have a, a couple of questions about uh, the, the touch, at least, on the, the idea of the nation. So maybe we can we can I can give you those two together. Uh, the first is that um, the, there's a curiosity about Vico's focusing on quote things civil, uh, which are at times at least so not not so much nation states as they are in his words civilization. So we'd be interested in your thoughts on that. And the the second is to ask whether Vico has a concept of the nation. Um, and if so, how it might compare with Marx's ideas about, uh, about the same. Well, um, I mentioned this uh, question of civil war. Actually, it's a quotation from Vico, this one. And I believe that the, the most useful thing for us is to um, develop um, this opposition between you know, the realm of nature and the, the civil war, we, war. We make the civil war, right? So um, what we do not make is uh, nature, you know, Mark called natural history. I made a more correct quotation from, from Vico New Science. Um, but um, since we make it, we can better understand uh, history because you know we can better understand uh, what what we do so i will use civil war in uh, that way more than in the question of uh, of uh, of nations so perhaps civilization because you know, you know there is this history this idea eternal ideal history that exists but then there is also this um, uh, particular history of uh, every um, uh, specific uh, society. Uh, the question of nation for Marx is, uh, is actually uh, complex because um, as we know, Marx is a theorist of internationalism and is in favor of, uh, of this. And this is uh, an essential point of his uh, political theory. And um, at the same time, I don't want to say that Marx is uh, uh, negating this idea. And uh, I don't know, a significant thing that I will mention as an example is uh, the fact that Marx pays, uh, um, paid a lot of attention to the independence of uh, Poland, hmm? of the nation of Poland against the occupation of Russia, which was seen for Marx actually on the um, um, European scale in terms of international relations, an essential element for the emancipation of Polish people and also for the um, um, liberation of Europe against this um, um, idea of Russia being very conservative. At the same time, Marx is paying attention to this question of nation uh, with regard to Irish and to the occupation of, of England. And uh, when actually Marx is uh, trying to deal with this new society that is born in the international as a new society, the International Working Men Association, 1864, 1872, I apologize for being so um, um, specific because of course not everybody is uh, a scholar of, uh, of Marx or Vico and are aware of these things. Well, Marx says that uh, um, the international must um, give a lot of attention to the independence of Ireland and to the presence of, of Irish. So Marx is not negating, this is what, I want, what I'm trying to say in a few words, not negating this aspect 
and not saying that internationalism um, means that uh, there must be no attention, particularly for uh, groups, nations, ethnicities that have been, you know, suffering a lot from um, exploitations of uh, the past. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one one more question, and there's one that perhaps ties a little bit to where you went in that last. So um, there's a question about uh, actually about colonization and um, religion. So the, the question runs that when Marx writing um, Capital, capitalism had expanded colonizing into many countries and Protestantism was fairly well set. Well, Vico was writing um, in 1725 Italy, where uh, Protestantism hadn't really been established there, at least. Um, and he, the question really is how these, these contextual factors made a difference in their thinking, if you could perhaps address that. Well, um, for Vico, I don't think it did, and uh, he didn't pay a lot of attention to this Protestantism. Um, I don't know if the person who asked the question is, um, taking the interpretation of Weber as a, uh, an important element of the uh, making of capitalism. For Marx, on the contrary, I would say that, yes, this was a, um, a decisive element. And uh, in order to understand this, I invite uh, to read um, the important part of Capital Volume 1 about primitive accumulation, right? <clears throat> because Marx um, you know, clearly indicated that uh, there is a a significant part of the you know, primitive accumulation of capital that is, that is, that is coming from, from there. And also, as I said, and I want to finish with this, um, at the end of his life, Marx is um, taking uh, an even stronger position, if it is possible, not that Marx was denying this before, about the fact that uh, the colonization of uh, Europeans in Algiers, in Mexico, in, in, in India, um, didn't bring this, um, going back to the question of historical progress, this development of society. It's not that capitalism is bringing, um, I don't know, development of the economy and therefore a faster way to emancipation. So for Marx, it is very clear, studying anthropology, studying ethnology, reading this uh, description of the societies made by uh, this new generation of scholars from 1857. I mentioned the text on the Grundrisse to the end of his life, Kowalewski is one of them. It is clear for Marx that actually the colonization is destroying this sense of community. And it is very clear for Marx that he is definitely not in favor, actually uh, in, a, in a most strongest possible opposition to this idea that capitalism must manifest itself and that there is this stage idea that uh, after capitalism it is easier to make a socialist society. This is definitely not the idea of Karl Marx and he left many interesting indications about the fact that this communal form this communal form of socia so, uh, sociality and also of production must be preserved without thinking that, of course, this is socialism, because for Marx, socialism is not a return to the past. We can leave the return to the past to Vico. Thank you very much. And uh, we've, we've come to the end of the time, but clearly not to the end of either the questions or the interests that, uh, that people have. Um, uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and uh, Professional Studies at York University, I want to thank everyone for attending the 2022 VECO lecture. Um, we obviously all miss our in-person engagements and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get together the next time um, we, uh, we meet for the VECO lecture. But it's good to see at least that even in these challenging times, uh, we are able to engage in interesting intellectual conversation. Again, a special thank you to Marcello Mosto for sharing his time and expertise with us on these two important thinkers, Vico and Marx. Uh, make sure to check out his latest book, The Last Years of Karl Marx, an intellectual biography from Stanford University Press. And you can follow Marcello on Twitter if you're so inclined, at Mar Musto. Um, stay safe, everybody. We hope again that you have a great rest of your week.